Buonasera a tutti, siamo ehm, Guido Arari eh, da questa parte dello schermo e Gerd Mankovic. Uh, hi Gerd. Hi Guido. <ride> hi, Gerd è nella sua casa nel Cornwall e eh, anche lui partecipa al progetto eh, di photo action per Torino. Eh, ricordo a tutti, è una raccolta fondi per il eh, fondo straordinario Covid-19 eh, di UG Onlus e Città della Salute e della Scienza. Eh, oltre 100 fotografi hanno donato una loro opera che viene eh, venduta eh, come stampa fine art esclusiva per questo progetto, in edizione aperta, quindi in, in più copie. E, e può essere acquistata sul sito uh, www.photoactionpertorino.org uh, uh, tutto questo succederà nei prossimi giorni fino al 21 maggio quindi avete tempo solo fino al 21 maggio per uh, acquistare uh, le nostre foto quindi Gerard, uh, vi dico brevemente è uh, uno dei grandi fotografi musicali di sempre uh, a Uh, cominciato nei primi anni 60, giovanissimo, uh, poi vi racconterò alcune cose, la conversazione sarà in inglese, quindi sarà anche un'occasione per fare un po' di pratica. Uh, Gerrit parla abbastanza lentamente, quindi possiamo capire uh, tutto o quasi tutto. E voglio solo dire che Gerrit è stato giovanissimo, uh, il fotografo personale dei Rolling Stones ha realizzato diverse copertine per loro eh, che vedremo eh, nella proiezione, eh, ha cominciato a 15 anni a, a fotografare e a 17 stava già collaborando con i Rolling Stones, ha fotografato Jimi Hendrix, ha fotografato gli Yardbirds, tanti gruppi di quegli anni storici, ha creato delle immagini iconiche per le copertine dei dischi e di fatto ha inventato uno stile che poi è stato replicato da molti altri fotografi negli anni a seguire. Gerd ha avuto e ha tuttora una carriera lunghissima, ha attraversato diversi decenni perché ha festeggiato 50 anni e più di fotografia musicale e quindi negli anni 70 ha firmato copertine per gli Eurythmics, per Kate Bush, per i Jam, i Duran Duran, i Wham e, e poi gli Oasis. Insomma, eh, è una storia molto lunga e molto appassionata. Eh, come sapete, forse, eh, la foto che ci ha donato è un pezzo unico ed è una foto di Lucio Battisti. E quindi Gerard ci racconterà fra poco come mai un fotografo inglese ha fotografato la star numero uno italiana. Ok, cominciamo quindi con Gerard. Vediamo subito la foto di Lucio Battisti. Eccola qui. Una foto... Eh, Spontanea, quasi una foto delle vacanze, molto, molto inusuale per, per Lucio. Uh, però arriviamo per gradi a questa foto. Gered? What? Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think people will, uh, will really freak out when they see this, especially the people who don't know you. This is the Rolling Stones. In uh, 63, 64, or 65, I don't remember. 65. And uh, I already introduced you saying that you started out very young in, 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 in photography. And uh, I'd like to say uh, that um, your father used to work in cinema. Uh, he was a script writer. Uh, he was, um, was a producer as well. He was, he was a producer, he was a screenwriter, he was a novelist, he yeah. was a playwright, he was a real uh, renaissance man, a sort of yeah. a 1950s, 60s theatrical renaissance man. Yeah, and uh, what happened was uh, he was very good friends with many actors and directors, and uh, one day uh, somebody came to your house Uh, a friend of your father with a with a Hasselblad camera and uh, that 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 opportunity turned you on 
to photography and uh, this man was this man was peter sellers the great la pantera rosa actor. the pink panther <laughs> So what Panther. happened? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, he came for Sunday lunch to talk to my dad about a film project that they were working on. And yeah. he was a very keen amateur photographer and yeah. he brought with him a complete Hasselblad 500C kit with like three lenses and uh, magazines and everything. But he also brought a big old Polaroid the sort of Polaroid camera that folded, you know, a, a, yeah. a field camera. Yeah. And um, and he took some photographs of me and my brothers, and I, I was completely blown away with the magical process. And then he started showing me the Hasselblad, and um, but he did it all in a Swedish voice, in a mad comedy Swedish voice. And I was weeping in laughter. <laughs> and it was just, it was just wonderful, a wonderful experience. And after that, I just knew I wanted uh, to be a photographer and I wanted to own a Hasselblad. Yeah. But you, you were in a... Both, of my, both wishes came true. I wish I had a Hasselblad at that age. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you were uh, the right man at the right time in the right place you were in london with rock music exploding and lots of new bands uh, uh lots of pioneering music and uh, and you started photographing marianne faithful that was the beginning right that was pr pretty much the, the beginning actually My first, I did my first album cover in 1963, but I met Marianne in 1964 when she was promoting As Tears Go By, her first single. Yeah. And um, I started photographing her. She was just, she was beautiful and she was funny and uh, she was a delight to be with and, and a joy to photograph. So I started photographing her and then I took her um, one day to this pub in London called the Salisbury Pub. In yeah. St. Martin's Lane. And um, I photographed her there for the album cover for her first album, which was called Come My Way. Yeah. And she was managed by this extraordinary man called Andrew Lou Goldham. And Andrew um, saw these pictures. I'd never met him uh, in spite of photographing Marianne three or four times. And he saw these pictures. And for some reason, he just thought I would be the right photographer with the Rolling Stones, and he asked me to come and meet him and the Rolling Stones. Wow. Yeah, wow. Fantastic. So how, how did that first meeting go? You once told me that you, at the time, you were younger than the Stones, and the Stones trusted you because you may be more uh, in tune with uh, current trends. Was that true? <laughs> well, I... I <laughs> I'm still younger than most of the living <laughs> uh, stones. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I was. I was um, I was 17 when I met them. Yeah, so wow. I was, I was 17 when I did this, yeah, wow. this picture here, Caged. And then I was 18 when I went to America with them at the end of the year. But yeah. um, I think that being so young and so enthusiastic, Um, and so just excited to be working with them. I had no pretense, you know, I, I didn't, um, I, I didn't bring anything to the table other than my energy and my enthusiasm and my youth. Yeah. And they seemed to like that. I mean, they, they, they were very welcoming, very friendly, very nice, very easy to work with. I didn't yeah. have any problems with them at all. So uh, was there anybody in the band that was particularly <laughs> collaborative uh, on the creative uh, side, uh, suggesting ideas? Uh, no, I, I, I don't really remember that. Mick was always uh, very interested in everything that was going on. He was interested in all aspects of, of mm. what was going on. 
but I don't really remember anybody uh, being collaborative. And I think one of the reasons for that um, was because we didn't have Polaroid. Right. They really had to trust me completely. They couldn't see what I was doing. I mean, yeah. maybe yeah. maybe somebody would run over and have a look in the camera at the rest of the band and go, yeah, this is looking great, you know. Yeah. But, but um, apart from that, um, I, I just remember we working with them um, and directing them in the simplest possible way, trying to get a series of pictures, as many as possible um, that I composed to work for an album cover. Yeah. Um, this, this was one of them. And this became the album cover for, in England, it was called Out of Our Heads. Yeah. Well, as we said previously, uh, a shot like this is fantastic. I mean, of course, uh, the composition is is amazing. And it's set, as we will see in other photos that we're going to show uh, in a moment, it set the, a template for how to uh shoot uh, a five piece band or or a six piece band um highlighting either the singer or the guitar player uh and i think this is really interesting the way you created these images um uh very spontaneously you know they don't seem too structured although they they are well, yeah, they are structured in the sense that it's a it's a formal photographic session. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've all gathered together to take photographs. So in that sense, it's structured. Yeah. It's not really structured otherwise because I wasn't experienced enough to know how to structure a session yet. I mean, I had my ideas. I'd set up a background. I do my lighting roughly so that i wasn't messing around too much uh, mm -hmm. with them i tried to be as ready as possible and yeah. then we would just pull pull things together you know the compositional issues you very sweetly say that i created a a template for band photography i just yeah. don't think that yeah. i felt that there were that many options i mean you know, Robert Freeman's portrait of the Beatles yeah. with the Beatles, yeah. the black and white portrait. I mean, I think that had changed everything as far as how you present a band. Yeah. And I was just trying to find uh, interesting and different ways of photographing a group. And mm -hmm. if, if one thing with the Stones was that you really didn't matter who you put in front, they all had such powerful identities, even then, yeah. Um, yeah. that they would all project. I mean, even if you're looking at this picture now, uh, if you look, even Bill, who's at the back, is still pushing himself forward. He still has a presence in the picture. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that we learned very quickly about how to put a, a group photograph together. Yeah. Giving enough space to yeah. express themselves. And you did something so similar easy. years later uh, with Oasis. Yes. Well, I thought at the time, I thought Oasis were a tribute band. I, I thought they were a Rolling Stones Beatles tribute band. And I suggested to the magazine that we were shooting for that I did a sort of pastiche yeah. Between the Buttons, my Rolling Stones cover. And um, and everybody thought that was a good idea. And um, and this is one of the shots from that. It's yeah. not the cover yeah. shot, but it's one of the shots yeah. from that. Yeah. Yeah. This is Paul McCartney, who you shot in the studio. Actually, uh, I asked you once years ago, you, you had all that access to the Stones. How come you never shot the Beatles? Were you perceived as a Stones man? I, I think I probably was. Um, I felt that I was a Stones man. And I, yeah. I, I knew the Beatles a little bit socially. I knew Paul uh, better than the others. 
Uh, and I think they were aware of me, mm. but I was never asked to photograph them. Yeah. And I think partly that was because they had a great relationship with Robert Freeman through that first part yeah. um, of, of the 60s. Yeah. And by the time, I mean, Freeman did, what was it, five albums, I think four or five albums yeah and then by the time they got to the white album and abbey road um they'd moved on so far yeah but no i never photographed them i've i did a i did a cover for george harrison yeah in 1986 i did his um cloud nine cover yeah which was a great a great session a great time yeah and here's the yardbirds again uh Great composition, great formation, and the free. I love all these shots. And Hendrix, Hendrix must have been an incredible experience, uh, very particular because uh, uh, I think he had just released Hey Joe and uh, he hadn't performed in Monterey yet. So you created an icon before he became a legend. Yes, although, um, thank you. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to say that the photograph uh, wasn't really seen very much at the time because I'd insisted on shooting it in black and white. I, I did the whole session just in yeah. black and white. And um, I, I know that that was the right thing to do, but it was a bad a mistake from a commercial point of view. Yeah. Because at the end, the record company wanted color photographs and uh, and my photographs really didn't get widely seen at that time. It was only in the 90s, in the mid 90s, that a version of the classic picture of him with his hands on his hips was yeah. used for a record cover. And then suddenly that image became incredibly famous all around the world. Yeah. Yeah, I must say that um... When we started Wall of Sound Gallery, one of the first uh, shows we've had was uh, your exhibition. You're breaking up. Sorry? Guido, you're breaking up. I didn't hear a word of that. No, I said that uh, when we launched uh, years ago Wall of Sound Gallery, one of the first uh, exhibitions we've had was your, uh, your show of Hendrix photos which you, as, as in the previous portrait, you had sort of remixed uh, with colors and different papers and uh, materials. It was really interesting show. It was, uh, and it yeah. was lovely to do it. And it was lovely to be with you there in Alba. Yeah, and, uh, thank you. It was a, it was a lovely show. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think is I, I wanted to experiment I always wanted to experiment. And I first started um, trying to do different things with my pictures, particularly my Hendrix pictures, back in the 90s, back in the mid 90s. Yeah. And I started colorizing yeah. them and treating them in different ways. And it was very successful. And I was encouraged by that. And um, I've been doing it ever since. Yeah. And uh, well, let me show a few more of your photos. The jam. Duran Duran. This is the 80s, late 70s. Generation X with Billy Idol. Again, great composition. Thank you. And Eurythmics. I never yes. understood why they, they put a painting uh, on the cover instead of the actual picture, but you know. No, I never understood it either. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kate Bush, fantastic, an artist we we both work with, and uh, and you you were uh, uh, crucial in defining our visual identity uh, um, for the first two albums. This is yes. uh, the cover for Lionheart. Yes. Was it a special collaboration for you? Was uh, how interesting it was to create. Uh, almost from scratch, you know, the visual identity of a young artist. Well, I, it's my favorite, that's my favorite thing to do. I love working with young artists and 
this particular artist was simply a marvelous person to work with. I mean, she, yeah. was, she wasn't just an incredibly beautiful young woman, but she was so uh, energetic and so creative. And yeah. she, was so, um, she was so willing to um, experiment with different ideas. She was a marvelous subject and I loved yeah. working with her. And yeah. um, uh, we had four very successful um, sessions together um, from right the beginning uh, of her career in 78 uh, yeah. to 79. And it was, a, it was a wonderful, wonderful period. And I, I really, um, I loved working with her and I love the pictures that I did with her. I'm very, yeah. very proud of the work, yeah. And we, we also had a great show together at Snap Galleries in London in 2014 showing our stuff so we had a great great experience together uh, which then led to uh, our books of those photos uh, which was a uh, uh, another amazing experience and here's another great great shot of Wham well, I, I shot ah. this. oh, oh, oh go ahead go ahead no I was just gonna say that um... I shot this for a, a magazine called Smash Hits, and they used to have a poster that yeah. you could pull out of the magazine. And I shot this, I designed this so that if you were a George fan, you could have the poster like this. But if you were the Andrew fan, you could turn the poster over. <laughs> right. And yeah. Andrew would be in the dominant position <laughs> on top. <laughs> <laughs> This is an interesting thing, which uh, is slowly leading us to the image that you donated to for action for terrain. Yes. Who's this? Anna Oxer. Ah. Um, <laughs> this is Anna Oxer. Wow. And this was for the... Now, I don't remember a huge amount about this session. I mean, this was for uh, uh, her Italian label it was a, an album that was produced by andrew oldham that's how i got oh, involved. Wow. yeah and um and andrew said to me you know this is beautiful italian young italian girl i don't know how old she was 17 or something when yeah. we did this 1979 and um i had this idea um, of giving the subject the flashlight yeah and, and controlling it, I would control it, so I would trigger it off, but they would hold it and make shapes with it. And I it was an idea that I'd experimented with, and I just thought it would really work with her. There's something quite powerful yeah. about it. And she was so beautiful and pretty, and, and, um, and we had a lovely session together. I don't remember anything about the album, but I know that she's become, I mean, she's a, very well known here yeah. in Italy, and I know that you photographed her yeah. two or three times. Maybe. Yeah, I think I, I I shot two or three album covers in 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 the ni early nineties. Uh, but I mean, I think judging from the look, I think this must have been in the eighties or or late seventies. And uh, I think it, you 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 use the same idea in a different way with Sparks. Because I remember shots yes, of the sparks I holding. Uh, I did. Yeah. Yes, I used that idea about three times. I used wow. it with a, <laughs> uh, a young, yeah, just three times. But I used it with, um, uh, I don't know whether Anna Oxa was first or whether Sparks was first. But it was, uh, it, with Sparks, it was particularly good because they were so crazy yeah. You know, and they made such fantastic shape. And also they, um, because, you know, Ron and Russell, Russell's the very pretty one, and Ron's the one with the funny moustache. Yeah. Uh, Ron didn't mind if he made himself ugly or odd or weird. In fact, the, the, the weirder he was, the, the better he liked it. Uh, and so they were particularly <laughs> good to work with. Uh, yeah. But uh, Anna Rocha was just pretty and, and and um, lovely, lovely girl, but I don't remember anything about the album. Yeah. So they didn't even let you listen to the music before the shoot. 
not on that occasion. Oh, I right. think maybe Andrew has played me yeah. something, but I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, this the Italian experience, let's call it that way, uh, then gave you the opportunity to, to, to work with Lucio Battisti, who was uh, and still is one of the biggest stars ever. Actually, one of what, a great fan of his was David Bowie. Uh, and they were both on RCA at the time. Um, so uh, he's always been very a strange uh, performer uh, in the sense that he toured very briefly in the early 70s and then stopped completely and um, devoted himself to uh, recording albums. And, um, uh, and later in his career, he was very ill at ease with his own legend. So he produced a um, more complex album, both on, 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 on the music side and, uh, and, uh, and the lyrics as well, using new lyricists for this. But in, in this photo, uh, he looks very happy and cheerful. And, and the whole concept that we'll see in a minute of, of, uh, of the album cover, um, I mean, you could have shot that without him, you know? Well, with, with, with a sidekick. The, the actual cover, <laughs> yeah. the actual cover, we could have done with any, anybody. You're quite right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, Let me find out. Yeah. I don't know whether I sent you the actual cover. No, I have it here. Oh, you have it. All here. right, this is the cover. So that could be anybody in 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 Lucio's uh, clothes. But um, so the interesting thing is that there actually is a link with Anna Oxa, because it was because I did the pictures of Anna Oxa that the same person at RCA uh, in in Rome. Uh, really liked what I did and suggested me to Lucio when Lucio said that he wanted to do the photo session in England. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a really quite a strange story because Lucio had a, a dream, apparently, and in his dream he had a vision and he saw this little building uh, and the track going up the cliff and mm -hmm. the sea and the rocks and he just wanted that to be the background for this particular album and he didn't know where it was or where he'd seen it or how it comes so i got a call from rome uh, to explain to me what this was and uh, this image this vision and um and we then set about trying to find it. I got a location manager oh. and we talked about it and they came back and, and they found this. This is a, a Coast Guard um, station. This is where they launch uh, a boat from. Yeah. Coast Guard boat, and a, you know, an emergency, a rescue boat. Yeah. And yeah. So that that's the ramp that's going into the sea. And um we had some reference pictures and we sent them over to Rome and Lucio saw this one and he just said, that's it. That's, that's where I, that's my vision. Yeah. And, then he, and then he came over to England and we went to this location. This location is in Wales. Mm. Uh, and he had the Commodore, the white naval Commodore outfit. Mm -hmm. And he basically said to me, he said to me, I want to be there and I don't want to be there. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be seen. And I had this idea um, of using a huge mirror, yeah. a great yeah. big mirror, six foot high, uh, as a sort of mysterious doorway into another world. And he just performed, really, um, making shapes. And you said earlier that this, you know, we couldn't have done this with anybody else. I mean, only he could have made this shape or have this vision. Yeah. And he yeah. was absolutely uh, fantastic to work with. He was, his energy was enormous. 
he was terribly funny. He, he, he had a fantastic sense of humor. And, um, uh, and as you can see, this beach was a public beach and we had to shoot in between people walking their dogs. And he thought that was terribly funny, you know, and, uh, but, but we, we got a fantastic session and, um, tried to find different ways to use this mirror uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to try and make, um, uh, create a mystery, a sense of mystery to yeah. show him without ever seeing him. And when we were doing this, uh, the mirror, I was using the mirror as a light source to reflect the sun. And we worked on against some rocks. Uh, you should, yeah. And using the mirror as a light source projected this fantastic shadow onto the rocks. And I took some pictures of that. I thought it was really mysterious and interesting. It looked like a bit like a cave painting or yeah. the doorway to another world or something. Anyway, when I showed him the pictures, uh, he said to me, he sent a message to me uh, <laughs> saying, that's my favorite portrait. <laughs> That's the best, best portrait I've ever had. And then the photograph that you've got uh, for the charity, um, yeah, yeah. that was a, a, a really just a little photograph we did at the end um, because I said to him, we have to do an ordinary portrait. You know, your publicity department has made me swear that I would take an ordinary <laughs> portrait of you. And he yeah, was very yeah. resistant about it. He didn't really want to do it, but he did it for me, and he and he just gave me that lovely smile. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah. And it, he was a lovely, lovely man. I loved working with him. We had such fun. He made us honestly. We can I tell you a bit more about the story? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. We um we stayed in the worst hotel I've ever been in in my life. It was it it was really the worst hotel I've ever been in. And the food was simply awful. But they did have some quite nice red wine. And yeah. we got, yeah. uh, I had two assistants with me, so there were four of us. And we got through about six bottles of this red wine. So we were quite drunk. Loaded. And we were <laughs> loaded. And we were exhausted from being outside all day. And the food, every piece of food, every order that we made, the food was more awful. And finally, the waitress, who was just so angry with us because we were loaded and we were being stupid and we were laughing and we were talking loud, and she bought a cheese board. And this cheese board was so awful that we all actually fell off our chairs streaming with laughter the cheese board and then lucio did this fantastic thing describing the cheese board in italian like he was a sort of connoisseur of cheese and i tell you man we were just weeping with laughter it was such fun man. such fun did you ever see him again did you ever see him again? No, never. Uh, I, I had no contact with him or the record company. <laughs> they never used me again. Yeah, the record uh, company never, must have hated you. The record company must have hated you. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. And you I, see I, the little flowers. You see the I, little I, flowers. The Where? little flowers are all, uh, you see the little flowers, the little yellow and white flowers. All right. Yeah. They're all our, they're all our flowers. We bought, we bought oh. hundreds of flowers <laughs> and the wind, the wind kept blowing them off the mountain. <laughs> the we have to enlarge the, the, the photo to, to, to see a little bit of his face and expression. Yes, but it's not, it's he, not very sharp. The scan I think he, he must have been very proud of the concept. Yeah, and uh, I I don't know if it's right after this album that he signed to Sony, <laughs> maybe oh, because of this cover. This, I don't know. This was oh, 1982, uh, I think. Yeah, I think in. Oh, uh, hang on. 
No, I think he signed to Sony much later than that, probably in the late 80s. Yeah, or early 90s. Yeah. No, late 80s. Yeah. And um, yeah, well, well, Garrett, this is a great story. This is absolutely a great story. And uh, uh, actually, we have uh, another photographer in uh, photo action for Turin uh, called Cesare Monti, who passed away a couple of years ago. Well, he was in the early 70s. He was the personal photographer of Lucio. And um, especially when Lucio launched his own label uh, and uh, Cesare shot all the artists on the label, plus he shot all the iconic covers uh, of the great artists from that time. And, um, and he has uh, also great stories, but he says that basically they would work, you know, in a, in a very spontaneous way, no concepts. You couldn't put a concept, you know, on, on Lucho. And um, he would give very little time to the shootings. Uh, and they were mostly portraits. Actually, I'm quite amazed that uh, this is a location shot because many photos were taken either at home, at his home, or in a studio or around his house. I mean, this is quite a trip for him to, to, to consent to, in a way. So this is really, really interesting shoot. There's a, there's a question well, it's, by... It's quite a yeah. There's a question by John O'Connor on another subject. He's uh, asking about your, your work with Toya. Do you have any funny stories about working with her? <laughs> um, I work with Toya. I've worked I'll try, with Toya while you talk, I'm, I'll try times. and find a picture. Yes, I didn't send you a picture. No, no, I have one. Um, Let me find it. There's a lovely picture of her with, with red hair, yeah. orange hair. It's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I found I it. Um, Toya to yeah. was uh, uh, another of the extraordinary, uh, frenetic, dynamic, creative bundles of energy, um, very conceptual. Uh, it's interesting you talk about Lucio not being conceptual, and yet that yeah. cover I did with him was incredibly conceptual. Um, with uh, Toya, everything, yeah, that, that's one of my favorite portraits yeah. uh, of Toya. Um, I, she, was, uh, she was very creative, very high energy, uh, had this sort of um, element of, of punk to her but was very theatrical and very very flamboyant and um i did a couple of sleeves for her uh and we worked on a, a quite a, two or three quite interesting projects and um i don't think i have any specific stories i have to say none that come to mind straight away just to say that she was uh, incredibly rewarding to photograph because she was so like so many of these really fantastic female artists that I've been fortunate enough to work with, Kate, Toya, Kim Wilde, um, Annie uh, Lennox. Annie Lennox. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they have this uh, chameleon like quality. They're able to transform themselves very subtly sometimes, very boldly in other ways on other occasions into different characters and they're incredibly uh, rewarding to work with you know you yeah. get so much back from them so yeah toya was a, a, a terrific terrific subject and i photographed her uh, relatively later uh, after that sort of um, late 70s early 80s explosion and uh, we did uh, two portraits uh, for a magazine that were very uh, much more sophisticated um, uh, and yet still had fantastic energy. Everything she did, uh, she did with terrific commitment and energy. 
Yeah. Great subject. Well, look, Garrett, I see something in the background and uh, talking about rewards. <laughs> I think <laughs> we we had uh, our rewards. Show me yours. Oh, I'll show me. I'll show you yours, mine, if you show me yours. So do I have to show you mine first? <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, fantastic. All right. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is mine. So this is this is for ABC. Yeah. Uh, Lexicon of Love. All right, and uh, this is uh, from yes. David Sanborn for his album uh, Change of Heart. So wow. Very so nice. nice. I, I, this is there's a nice. There's a nice story with this, I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, so uh, ABC 1982, I think. And um, um, I'm asked to work with ABC. We do a couple of sessions together. We all get on really well. And it comes time to do the album cover, yeah. The Lexicon of Love. And when they come to the studio, um, they say to me, well, where are, you, where are all your gold discs? <laughs> And I said, well, I, I don't have any gold discs. And they said, but that's ridiculous. I mean, you've done hundreds of covers and they've sold millions of records. You should have a gold disc. And I said, well, yeah. I'll tell you what, when this album goes gold, give me a gold disc <laughs> and, and thought nothing of it. And then this album, Lexicon of Love, was a huge, it was the biggest album yeah. of 1982, a huge success. The cover was enormously popular. And sure enough, they send me a gold disc. And I, it's a really sweet and touching uh, thing. I've always been very thrilled. So it's my, my special ABC gold disc. All right. <laughs> wait, a, wait a second. I have to yeah. switch to the photo again. Just a second. All right, and okay, so, okay, Garrett, uh, I think, um, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm getting messed up here. Um, you have to be your own engineer. Yeah. All right. This and this, okay, getting there. Right. Ah. So we're right back to your picture, but first, before we end, before we wrap it up, tell me about this. Oh. Uh, well, that's, uh, okay, that's unexpected. So um, <laughs> I'm sure you have personal projects which you pursue. Uh, yeah. And I, my personal project is rust. I love rust and I love rusted objects. And um, I love looking at things uh, that you don't normally see or you dismiss or you throw away. And I've always loved that. And um, somebody uh, knew this about me and they said i've i've just found this camera and um they they gave it to me and so uh it's i think it's absolutely beautiful i love it yeah. um it, it, it's i think it's probably a russian single lens reflex camera mm -hmm. um but uh anyway so it's part of a series of objects that you can see. You can see more of them on my website, Mankiewicz.com. Mm -hmm. But it's a personal project. I, I, I've never shown them. Uh, I've only sold a few privately. Um, you know, it, it's, I think that we all have personal things that we do. I wanted to do something that was as far away from rock and roll and music and people yeah. as I could. And um, and so rust and uh, and rust in all its beauty 
is uh, is my personal project. I call yeah. it Lost Lost in Rust. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Garrett. Listen, it's been fantastic to talk to you and hear your stories. Uh, you have to, you have to make more books. I don't know. You're working on a on a couple of new ones, so yeah. uh, we're looking forward to those. And uh, let me uh, tell uh, our listeners about the, the the project again, in Italian this time. Um, allora, questa foto di Gerard che vedete uh, sullo schermo di Lucio Battisti è, uh, fa parte del progetto uh, Photo Action per Torino. Eh, che potete esplorare in ogni dettaglio sul sito www.photoactionpertorino.org sono oltre 100 foto di fotografi eh, italiani e internazionali eh, che possono essere acquistate come stampe fine art eh, donando eh, al fondo eh, straordinario Covid-19 di Ugi Onlus e Città della Salute e della Scienza tutto questo fino al 21 e fino al 21 avremo dirette giornaliere sia su Facebook che su Instagram. E vi eh, ricordo quelle di domani, che sono tre, alle 18 eh, sarò qui su Facebook con Maria Vittoria Bacaus, eh, alle 18.30 Paolo Ranzani dialogherà con Marina Alessi e poi alle 21, sempre qui, eh, avrò il mio ospite Gio Pedisano. E quindi mh, vi mostreremo le loro foto, vi illustreremo i loro lavori e sarà un'altra occasione interessante di conoscere eh, i nostri autori eh, italiani. Benissimo. Garrett, let me thank you again for your time and uh, for donating this uh, beautiful image of Lucio. And we'll be in touch soon. And uh, probably we will do something special on the last day, on, on, on the closing night of the process. So we'll be in touch uh, over the next few days, okay? Okay, fantastic. Lovely, Guido. <laughs> great, to, great to see you and thank you so much. And stay safe and good luck with this fantastic charity. And I hope you sell masses of prints and raise lots of money for such a worthy cause. So Thank fantastic. you so much. Thank you so much. And stay safe, you too. Thank you. All right. Ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye.